Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Taking Stock Live with me, Kalila Reynolds, your host for the evening. It's my pleasure to be here with you. I love to see those of you who are on and waiting. Let me know in the comments where you are joining us from. We have a jam-packed show for you today. We're going to be talking about jam decks. Get your questions ready. You guys have been DMing me, finding me on Instagram, finding me on Twitter with all your questions. Now is your opportunity to ask your questions about how does jam decks work. And we're going to have on somebody from the Bank of Jamaica to explain. Also, make sure that you sign up for my newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. It is a free resource. We provide information directly to your inbox twice a week. And so that is something that you cannot afford to miss. So let's take a look at what's coming up, followed by what's hot in business. On this episode of Taking Stock, Jamaica is soon set to roll out its own digital currency, Jamdex. But how exactly will it work? Is it secure and why should you use it? So many questions. We'll get answers from the Bank of Jamaica's technical team. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. JFP and Edufocal are now officially listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. How did they do in early trading? And Massey's stock split is now in effect, but did it have any impact? And overseas, the Federal Reserve is expected to raise interest rates while uncertainty over the Ukraine crisis continues. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Education technology company Educocal and furniture manufacturing company JFP are both now listed on the junior market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. The two are the latest companies to have completed an initial public offer. Educocal shares were listed on the exchange on Tuesday and JFP's shares were listed on Monday. Both companies had relatively small offers, with Educocal only offering roughly 80 million shares to the public, while JFP offered 168 million shares to the public. Both offers were oversubscribed, with the JFP IPO opening on February 21 and closing the next day. Educocal's IPO opened and closed within one minute on March 3. According to Educocal, investors will receive up to the first 10,000 shares that they applied for, plus approximately 16.57% of the excess shares. As for JFP, investors will receive up to the first 12,500 shares, plus approximately 22.8% of the excess shares. Wigton Wind Farm says it will acquire a 21% stake in Flash Holdings. Flash Holdings is an equity holding company and the sole shareholder of Flash Motors Company Limited. Flash Motors is a Jamaican company which will distribute and sell electric vehicles. According to the announcement from Wigton, the purchase is part of its diversification efforts. The move will also boost the company's involvement in projects that seek to reduce the negative effects of climate change and sustain a healthy environment. FESCO has announced that it will be raising more funds through a $1 billion Jamaican dollar corporate bond. The five-year bond will be listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange's private market and arranged by NCB Capital Markets. In April 2021, FESCO raised some $500 million through an initial public offer. FESCO says the billion-dollar bond will allow it to join the cooking gas and LPG markets and expand its network of dealerships and service stations. And it was a busy week for the bond market as Victoria Mutual Investments Limited also announced plans to raise up to $3 billion through bonds. The investment company said the bond is being offered in two tranches. The first will earn interest of 6.5% per year for 18 months and the second will earn 6.75% interest for two years. VMIL said it's aiming for $2.5 billion to $3 billion from this offer, which runs from February 24 to March 25. This is the company's second debt issue in six months. VMIL said that a portion of the bond proceeds will be used to finance investments across the Caribbean. The rest will be used to refinance an older bond worth $196 million that matured in February 28. The company noted that following its triple B plus credit rating from regional credit ratings agency Caricris, the bond is being offered to both retail and institutional clients as a highly rated debt security. Alliance Finance Limited has been fined a total of $21 million or 12 months imprisonment for breaching the Banking Services Act. The company was also fined $50,000 or 9 months imprisonment for each count of 28 breaches of the Bank of Jamaica Act. 
Alliance Investment Management Limited and AFL and their president Peter Chin and Vice President Robert Chin were charged in December with various breaches of the Bank of Jamaica, the Banking Services and the Proceeds of Crime Acts. AFL pleaded guilty to the charges in January and the individual charges against the chains were dropped. The brothers had previously pleaded guilty to 28 counts of carrying on the business of lending foreign currency without being an authorized dealer and 8 counts of breaches of the Banking Services Act for accepting deposits without the requisite license from the BOJ. The chains are scheduled to appear before the Supreme Court on May 27 for mention in a benefit hearing to determine if they should be penalized for benefiting from the loans and deposits. They will also return to the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court on May 20 for breaches of the Proceeds of Crime Act. Savage X Fenty, the lingerie brand from artiste turned business mogul Rihanna, is reportedly considering going public following a $3 billion US dollar valuation. According to a report from Bloomberg, Barbados' newest national hero has been working with American investment brokers Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs on the IPO. The IPO could reportedly happen as early as this year. Analysts are suggesting that the valuation likely has more to do with Rihanna's stardom than a proven track record of sales. They point to the fact that the Savage X Fenty brand is less than five years old and only has a handful of brick-and-mortar stores in operation. Rihanna officially joined the ranks of billionaires last year, after Forbes estimated her net worth at 1.7 billion US dollars. The majority of her wealth reportedly comes from her cosmetics company Fenty Beauty, worth about 1.4 billion US. She currently holds an estimated 30% stake in the Savage X Fenty lingerie brand. What's Heart was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Our key word for 2022 is consistency. I've told you before that you can start investing with as little as a thousand Jamaican dollars, but the key to growing that into actual wealth is consistency. So here's what we're going to do. Step one, open your investment account. Step two, set up a standing order or a salary deduction with your employer to fund that investment account every month so that at the end of each month, you have money to buy stocks. Step three, you're going to watch my show, Taking Stock with Kalila Reynolds, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. on YouTube for news and analysis on the stock market. And if you're completely clueless as to how to get started, well, you take my Investing for Beginners Masterclass at kalilareynolds.com slash masterclass. 2022 is going to be your year. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Welcome back. Let's get this money indeed. I see a lot of you are tuned in already. Let me big up our, our early viewers. Uh, Joy says, looking out, I want to know more. Antoinette Todd says, I'm here waiting in Arizona. What's the weather like in Arizona right now, Antoinette? Keisha says, good evening. Colette says, let's get this money, guys. Marcus Sewell is tuning in from Flatbridge. Joy is in Kingston. Colette's also in Kingston. Suzanne is watching all the way in Negril. Uh, Colette in Kingston. Lucian Morris from Clarendon, but currently in St. Anne. Uh, Cheesy Golisa. <laughs> You guys kill me with the names. Cheesy is in Mobe, and Cheesy says, for sure, we want the digital currency. Lushand also says, a few business in, businesses in St. Anne already use the link payment. And Omar Irving says, live from Jacaranda Homes. Where is that? Where is Jacaranda Homes? That sounds interesting. I want you guys to hit that like button if you haven't already done so right here on YouTube. I see 126 people tuning in so far. We don't have 126 likes. So especially if you're watching us on mobile, you can very easily hit that like button and help YouTube tell other people and recommend this video to other people. You can also share it via WhatsApp, via email, uh, whatever your preference. Uh, share this video with somebody you think might benefit from this knowledge. So let's get right into this evening's discussion. And let me also say that if you have a question, even before the interview starts, post your question in the live chat right now, because 
I'm quite sure there are a million questions. I have a million questions about how Jamdex works. And I know that you have uh, questions, concerns on your mind. Let me know from now what your questions are so that we can get as many answers as possible to those questions. Let me introduce our guest for the evening. And that is Director of Payment Systems Policy and Development Department at the Bank of Jamaica. His name is Mario Griffiths. Mario, hi, welcome to Taking Stock. Good evening, Kalila. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Yeah, you look you look very astute, like you know the answers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so let's start very basic. Just explain to us what is Jamdex? Well, Jamdex is Jamaica's central bank digital currency. You know, it's uh, money in a digital form. That's the simplest way of explaining it. Uh, it is legal tender as it is issued by the Bank of Jamaica. It's also as a means of payment. So that's pretty much what Jamdex is. All right. So one of the main questions I have had about this is how is it any different than the money that's already in your bank and when you already do online transactions? Well, it's it's a little different, um, you know, in payment system terms, we, we tend to say that money in your bank is really commercial banks money and, and you know, banknotes, coins and Jamdex in this case is central banks money. So really the difference is in, uh, you know, the nature or the origin, I should say. Certainly it's about uh, dematerializing your banknotes and placing that in your commercial bank, which is now in electronic money or electronic form, right? So that's that's really the main difference. It's 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 the origin and it's really where it's uh, generated, whether it's from the central bank or uh, commercial bank. So do I need to have a commercial, a bank account in order to use Jamdex? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, if you don't have a bank account, certainly you can access Jamdex. Uh, you will access Jamdex uh, through your wallet provider. In this case, you know, wallet providers are deposit taking institutions, uh, commercial banks, you know, merchant banks, billing societies, as well as authorized payment service providers. So that's where you can access Jamdex. And, and all that is required, Kalila, is really you know basic information that you would provide when accessing a, a traditional bank account or deposit account. All right. So currently, the only wallet provider is mm -hmm. Link, which is a uh, which is by NCB, which is a major commercial banking institution. And you said in order to access it, you still have to provide that information to the wallet provider. So is it easier than opening an actual bank account? I, I would say it's a little easier, certainly, um, you know, what what the link provides for is an electronic KYC access. Um, and, uh, you know, based on the adjustment, right, you, you're just going to have to explain what that means for you know, <laughs> some people who don't know what KYC is. Sure, it's certainly. Electronic certainly. KYC access. So what do you mean by that? Electronic uh, know your customer. It's, it's the process within which they'll be utilizing to gather all the necessary information, which is what you would utilize uh, for accessing your bank account or a traditional deposit account. It's, it's providing that information electronically. Right. So uh, you will require a government issued ID. You'll also need to provide your name, your address and your tax registration number. And it also requires a, a photograph of yourself as part of that electronic uh, onboarding. So I don't need to go to know JP to verify documents and all of that. <laughs> certainly not certainly not yeah. because so actually, i actually actually did start the process uh, of uh, downloading link and, and setting yes. up my account and i said that you do you have to take like a picture from different angles and so so it's it's pretty interesting how it works we have a question online from cheesy gully side uh, who wants to know uh, says it would it would be awesome if we could use it without data or Wi-Fi because sometimes you go places and they say Wi-Fi down so you can't use your card. So does this actually require data or Wi-Fi or does it use the telecoms network like sending an SMS? 
Uh, that's a very good question. Certainly, it utilizes the data or Wi-Fi. And in that mode, we call that to be the online mode because you're connected to a network in, in terms of you know the internet or the telecoms infrastructure. Um, there's also the offline mode, and we will continue to work on that. That that we, you know, you can be partially offline and or you can be fully offline. And, and we're we're looking into to the hardware and the infrastructure and the process around that to ensure that we maintain the necessary security once you you hold Jamdex offline. But certainly in in the initial stages, it's uh, mostly online. All right, so eventually you will be able to use it without data, you're saying? Definitely. Okay, well, that's that's very reassuring to hear because not and that's a, that could be a barrier to entry for some who you can't afford data. And if you don't have the data, you can't you can't spend your own money. And that makes it unlike cash in a sense where you have to have something in order to make the transfer. So mm -hmm. we have another question from Jamelia. Three questions. <laughs> How is it issued? Where do I store it? Where can I spend it? All right. Well, certainly it's issued. Jamdex is only issued and a central bank digital currency is only issued by your country's central bank. In our case, it's the Bank of Jamaica. So we're the only ones that will issue uh, Jamdex. And we issue it, to, as I mentioned before, wallet providers who are depositing institutions, you know, commercial bank business societies, authorized payment service providers. And how do you store? Well, certainly you will store it in what we call a digital wallet. And a digital wallet tends to be an application on a mobile device that can be your phone, your tablet, or any other instrument that can you know, upload or download an application. And it's that wallet you'll utilize to store. Now, where can I spend it? You'll be able to spend the Jamdex anywhere it's accepted. So right now, I believe uh, the link that will be facilitating, you know, a storage and transactions utilizing Jamdex. I believe they have over 700 uh, locations where it can be spent. And you can also transact, you know, between person to person. So that, that's also available. So how do I get it then? Is it that I have to trade my physical cash for Jamdex or do I make a bank transfer from my bank account to my digital wallet? How, how do I mm. even get it? Sure. So there's a number of ways you can get it. And, and you've mentioned one, you know, it's it's um, uh, it's through an agent location or a bank location, depends on which uh, type of wallet provider. And you will hand over physical banknotes, coins, and they will then convert that and top up your CBDC wallet. Um, there are other mechanisms and it depends on which wallet provider and the innovation that they provide to you. Certainly, you'd be able to uh, transfer from your savings account into your CBDC wallet. So it's it's topping up is endless. And, and that's certainly up to the innovation that the wallet provider, your chosen wallet provider, you know, provides to you. So would it be kind of like buying a phone card? As easy as that. Mm, interesting. All right. So let's look at the wallet providers. So, so far we have NCB's link. And I heard the finance minister said that by June, we should have four others. I'm, I'm not sure if he said four in total or if it would be four others. So that would be five, including link. Will these different wallets be interoperable? So if I have link and you have another wallet from another financial institution, will I be able to send you money? The answer is yes. Certainly. And that was built into the architecture of uh, the CBDC system. Certainly, every institution will connect utilizing that same infrastructure, right, which, is, which, co which consists of hardware and software. And once you're connected and you have access to that infrastructure, certainly, you know, you can transact between institutions and it is interoperable. Mm. Nagash wants to know... Is there a transaction limit? <laughs> well, it's, it's a little different from, from cash. Uh, you know, I, I recognize the example of nothing over a million dollars, but certainly limits will be dependent on the wallet provider. You know, I, I may be risky, you may not be risky, Kalila, and that's up to the wallet providers to conduct their internal risk-based assessment of myself or you 
and they will be able to determine what that risk is, what how it is that they will mitigate those risks and what risks they want to take on. And it's based on that information that you provide to your wallet provider, they will determine whether they will put a limit on your, your CBDC wallet. So, okay, so it depends on each different provider. So we have to find out what those limits are or will be when those wallets come into effect. So we can find out from NCB Link next week because they'll mm -hmm. actually be joining me on, well, not on this program, but on Monday, I have an interview with NCB Link about how their app actually works. So any additional questions, we can ask them then. Uh, uh, Jamelia also wanted to know, she said she was trying to follow. Hold on, let me find the question. I'm trying to follow. So how much JMD for one Jamdex? It's one to one. Really, it's just the Jamaican dollar, your national currency in a digital form. So it really is one to one. Mm. Mark wants to know, can Jamdex only be used in Jamaica? Remember, we started off that it's a digital Jamaican dollar. And so I'm not sure if there's anywhere else in the world you can spend Jamaican dollars <laughs> except in Jamaica. So certainly right now it's for domestic use, but uh, certainly we'll we'll work on, you know, facilitating some amount of cross-border payment, you know, later on, further down the line. But right now, currently, it's only for domestic use. So that means I would not be able to use Jamdex on like a Cash App or Venmo or PayPal or one of one of those international services since it's only for domestic use, yes? Good question. Um, but that still depends on your wallet provider and the mechanism they're using behind those type of applications and how they're integrating. Certainly, if there's a foreign exchange mechanism behind it, then certainly you'd be able to, similar to how we purchase foreign currency now, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd exchange your Jamdex for whichever foreign currency and then utilize that on whichever platform. But it depends on what your wallet provider provides to you. And that's where the innovation and competition comes in. It's meeting the needs of the consumer. Right. So I suppose what you'd be able to do is use Jamdex to purchase U.S. dollars, which could be used on those apps the same way you'd use Jamaican currency to purchase U.S. dollars to use those apps. Yeah? That's correct. All right. Tons of questions coming in here, Mario. Levar wants to know what are the advantages and disadvantages of using Jamdex? Another great question. I've been seeing a lot of skepticism from people who are like, why should I even bother? <laughs> I mean, there are a number of benefits, um, certainly for, for users, for, for Levar, uh, it's mostly about safety and your safety. You know, if you're walking around with large sums of cash and that's visible, that's a risk to you. Now, with Jamdex, you'd be able to walk around with that same large amount of funds with nobody knowing because it's on your phone, it's on your device, it's in an application, and that's where, you know, you'd be able to access it from. Uh, there's also the convenience of Jamdex. You know, no longer you'll have to... Uh, you know, standing line, you know, waiting on an ATM, you know, your, your mobile device will act as a, as a, an ABM or a point, well, not ABM, but a point of sale machine where you can be able to transact. And certainly the big thing is no cost, zero cost to the end user. That is indeed a, a big benefit, no cost to use it. But again, there's been lots of skepticism about this. I see a lot of comments came in on Twitter after we, we made that, after we um, published that information. A lot of people saying, for now, no cost for now. That's how they really win and get you to use it. So, but isn't it since the central bank is not the one that actually has the wallet so the central bank is not administrating the use and dish well the distribution yes but not the use of jamdex so how do you ensure that the wallet providers don't charge fees on this because these providers are in it essentially to make money at the mm -hmm. end of the day yeah good question and that's why we are creating that competitive space yeah, we're adding additional, you know, wallet providers into the ecosystem to ensure that customers have a choice. So if it is that a wallet provider is charging and another isn't charging, then I'll just transition into the other wallet provider. You know, so once. But we, what if all of them start charging? Uh, then there's, uh, I mean, that's where we'll start to have that discussion. 
uh, and find out really why is it that they would be charging for you know a, a service but really they shouldn't but that's what banks do mario they charge no. for their services understood understood. understood but really they, they shouldn't because for jamdex it's really providing that digital footprint for uh, you know end users the citizens of jamaica and what that provides is information to wallet providers that they never had before. And only wallet providers will be able to, you know, look at the information and determine what are those value added services that I can charge for outside of Jamdex because I have this rich information that I never had before. Okay. All right. Let's see how this goes. Martin wants to know, what if the mobile device is lost? You're safe you're safe you know while jamdex you know it's it's utilized or you're accessing jamdex utilizing an application on your phone if you lose your phone you're fine all okay. that all that jamdex is still stored with your wallet provider right so it's the same as if you have any other app if you log in with a different device you, so how, how what are the login requirements anyway all right, so it's multi-factor authentication. You know, it's all about you know providing that security. So it's your username, password, probably a one-time uh, pin as well. So it's multi-factor. Uh, you know, and whatever the wallet provider uh, allows in terms of capabilities and features, depending on the device you're using, whether it's biometrics or facial recognition, then that's also you know another option uh, of of accessing and securing your Jamdex. Speaking of security, Roger wants to know what are the security risks of Jamdex? Uh, well, there will always be security risks. What, what I can say and share is that uh, CBDC and Jamdex is secure and it is safe. And it's safe at all three levels. It's safe at the level of the central bank. It's safe at the level of the wallet provider. And your safety is dependent on you. You not sharing your you know, pertinent information, your username and password with anyone else. And that's a, that's a norm. That's information that is provided to customers, you know, in those customer agreements upon signing up or registering for services like this. Okay. You did say multi-factor authentication in order to log in, but JMH has a follow-up. Would there be a biometric uh, requirement to enter Jamdex app for security in the case that your phone gets stolen? All right, and, and that is dependent on your wallet provider. Your application may have that feature for biometrics, and it may not. So it's up to your wallet provider to provide that level of security if it is that you require. But if your the chosen wallet provider doesn't, then there may be another wallet provider that provides that level of security that meets your needs. You know, on the issue of security, carrying cash is a security risk as well. So <laughs> that's something that the viewer should also pay attention to. Lucian wants to know, can I use or have more than one wallet at a time? Certainly. Well, you know, you can have multiple wallets with different wallet providers. So, yes, I'd say yes. Okay. We have more questions coming in. Let me see if I can find some others because a lot of people have a lot of questions on this issue. Here's another good one. Uh, Ayana is asking, where did it go? Ah, oh, the comment disappeared. All right, she wanted to know if Jamdex will be insured. All right, so Jamdex is not a deposit, right? You know, uh, insurance, you know, it comes in um, whenever there's a failed institution. So if you have a failed deposit-taking institution, that's when, you know, JDIC chips in with the insurance. So Jamdex is not a deposit. So that's the starting point there. But what I will say is the Bank of Jamaica does have the authority to step in at any point in time if there is a failed institution. And we would recover all the necessary information and system to ensure that we transition customers in a failed institution either into another wallet provider that's up and running and operating or out into you know banknotes and 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 so forth because we don't expect um you know cash to just disappear once we we've launched Jamdex, but certainly that's also an option. Mm. So how long will each transaction take? It's immediate. 
immediate. So I don't have to wait. Because you know we have in the banking system, we have like RTGS, stands for real-time gross settlement. And it's supposed to be immediate, but sometimes all tomorrow you still don't get your money. Same thing with ACH, automat Automated Clearing House. I think that's what it stands for. ACH transfer is supposed to be within, I think, same day, within a few hours. Sometimes tomorrow, all two days, you still don't get your money. So it's not immediate. And that's a disadvantage of relying on the funds transfers mechanism offered by the banks. But with the Jamdex now, once you send it, it's immediate, you're saying. You get your money same time. Real time. In real time. So, so the anticipation is that it's less than 10 seconds. Less than 10 seconds if your service provider is not acting up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So more questions. We have a lot of them coming in, Mario. Um, somebody wants to know, is CBDC or Jamdex the same as cryptocurrency? Certainly not. Certainly not. Um, there are three differences there. Um, <clears throat> for Jamdex, this is issued by the central bank of any country, I mean, for Jamaica. And central bank digital currencies are issued by central banks. For, you know, cryptocurrencies are private, are privately issued. So that's one major difference. Uh, a central bank digital currency, in our case, Jamdex, is legal tender. Cryptocurrencies tend not to be legal tender in most countries. I've only known one country that where it's legal tender but in most it's it's not legal tender and the liability is the other it's a you know jamdex in our case is a direct liability of the central bank for cryptocurrencies there tend not to be any liability unless it's on the private entity or it really doesn't have an anchor you know so that's the main difference between jamdex a central bank digital currency as well as cryptocurrencies Okay, somebody else is asking, will children be allowed to use Jamdex? Good question. And that depends on, again, your wallet provider. Certainly, you know, if you sign up Kalila and you're the primary account holder and your wallet provider allows you to have secondary accounts or sub accounts under that primary account, then you will be able to, um, you know, provide access to, to Jamdex and that app for, you know, in a parent child type of example. Robert wants you to elaborate on the $2,500 incentive. I don't know if you're able to do that, but let's see. <laughs> Since that was a, a policy decision by the government, no? Right, right. I won't be able to respond to that question. Because I don't do have you enough. know, and several people have asked this as well, whether people who started using Link before April 1, so they were the, the first, first users, would be able to benefit from that incentive or is it's only for people who sign up after April 1? That's a very good question. Um, uh, I, I think Link will be the best person to respond to that question. So I leave it until you, you have that interview with them. Right. So the next thing, follow up to that. So Link already exists, right? Yes. But CBDC, Jamdex, is not going to be issued to link until April 1. Is that is that how, how I understand it? Uh, I believe you're correct. National rollout is April 1. Yes, you're correct. So what link is currently using is not Jamdex. That's correct. Link That's is correct. utilizing, you know, based on that question we had asked initially, it's electronic money, which is where you're converting from paper into that electronic form, but that is stored within uh, the deposit taking institution. Mm, okay, so I can transfer between Jam. I can hold both types of currencies in my digital wallet. Yes, you electronic can. Electronic money and Jamdex. Yes, you can. Interesting. Like I really need to to see how this works come April one when it actually starts being used when the, the the Jamdex is issued to the banks for use via the app. Although I know some people have already been using it within the pilot project. So let's go through some more questions and there are lots. Cordia wants to know, can someone transfer Jamdex to another Jamdex user? Yes, 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 you can. And that's one of the use cases that's available in terms of that's person to person transfer. And that is available. Okay. Uh, 
JMH says cryptocurrency is illegal in many countries because it isn't government controlled. And we've already gone over that. Cryptocurrency is different from central bank digital currency, which is what Jamdex is. DeAndre says, I joined late. What I'd like you to do for me is to run over what Jamdex is. So DeAndre, once this video is over, you can scroll back to the beginning and get all that information. Uh, Christopher wants to know, can other software companies get authorized to develop wallets and handle transfers? Uh, certainly, you know, we, we have our uh, fintech regulator sandbox framework and within that framework, we have all the necessary requirements that need to be completed, you know, for us to, to even start looking at, uh, you know, these new types of wallets that persons want and companies want to, to, to engage in and develop. Uh, certainly, there are three things we tend to look at, you know, governance, risk management and consumer protection, because that's key. You know, so that sandbox framework is there and companies uh, may have a look at that. Mm. Nagash says, is there a regulatory body to keep wallet providers in check? Who would we complain to if there are any issues? Hmm. Definitely. That's the Bank of Jamaica. But first line, first line is always the wallet provider. You know, first line is a wallet provider and their dispute mechanism, customer uh, protection mechanism that they have in place and dispute resolution uh, mechanisms. Uh, if you're not getting anywhere with that, then certainly the Bank of Jamaica will be the next uh, step. Stronglink says it's confusing. Electronic money versus digital currency? <laughs> Again, it, there are subtle differences between uh, electronic money, digital currency. As I mentioned, it's always about the origin. You know, uh, electronic money tend to always move from physical banknotes and coins into the electronic mean, uh, as well as, you know, digital currency. The difference here is that digital currency, its origin is digital from birth. Right. So some people, I, I imagine, joined us late and we're getting some, some similar questions as to what has already been answered. So if you joined us late, I encourage you after this video is done to scroll back to the beginning, watch from the beginning, and hopefully your question can be answered. Nathan wants to know, will wallet providers issue physical cards which can be used online? So I guess like a credit card, Nathan, is that what you're asking? Well, that's up to the wallet provider. You know, uh, it's it's any payment instrument that connects into the CBDC ecosystem. You know, once you can connect into the ecosystem, if the payment instrument are payment cards, then certainly cards will be facilitated. Similar question from Lushand. Can the wallet be used to make online purchases? Now, you've already explained that this is Jamaican dollar currency and you can't spend Jamaican dollars outside of Jamaica. But if there is a Jamaican shop here in Jamaica that accepts Jamdex, can I use it to make purchases online? Mm -hmm. Good question. And, and again, that depends on how your wallet provider integrates with merchants and their websites and providing that back end support for accepting Jamdex online. So certainly it's up to the wallet providers to provide that service to their merchants. Yes, yeah, so I imagine that there would be an option upon checkout to select Jamdex as your currency. All right, so let's see another question. This is a good question. Will it be possible to convert Jamdex to physical cash at the ABM? Yes. Short answer, yes. How? Oh. All right. So again, you know, it's up to your wallet provider. And what what I like to say is it's it's very easy, you know, and depending on on what the wallet provider provides. So what we what is being provided you now is the application on a mobile device. And the interface will support what we call, it's a type of barcode and we call it a QR code, which is a quick response code. And, you know, it, it all depends on how your wallet provider will process that transaction. If it's you scanning that QR code or the ATM scanning the QR code. So it all depends on how they, they, they want to operationalize that aspect. And, and certainly, you know, once that QR code is scanned, then you will be able to, you know, uh, input how much physical cash you would like to receive from the ABM and that's it. Money will be moved from your Jamdex into your hands. 
I'll definitely be testing all of this out as soon as it's launched. Another good question from Dushin. If it's such a subtle difference between electronic money and Jamdex, did we really need a digital currency? Yes, yes. You know, it's it's looking into the future and seeing what what you know could happen. Certainly, what we are doing at the Bank of Jamaica is supporting a number of initiatives, such as the government's digital transformation process, as well as you know facilitating financial inclusion. And as part of financial inclusion, what we're doing is providing that optimum mix of payment instruments from which customers can choose. Right now you have cash, check, debit card, credit card, mobile wallets, you name it. And we're adding Jamdex into that mix for you to choose. And there are a number of uh, you know, innovative um, products that will you know, be laid on top of Jamdex, which we believe is a foundation for innovation in Jamaica as well. All right, uh, let me see if I can find any other new questions because some of the questions coming in have already been answered. And once again, I encourage you to scroll back to the beginning of the video and watch from the start, watch the interview from the start for the answer to your question. Oh, here's another good question. This person wants to know, is it possible for our wallets to be interest bearing instruments? And again, you know, if if we are if we use the example of uh, Jamdex being, you know, a digital version of your banknote. And if you have a banknote in your wallet or your purse or your pocket, it really doesn't earn interest. Um, I mean, it's not a deposit account. It's really your CBDC wallet, and that doesn't earn interest at all. All right. Uh, I have a question here that a lot of people have been asking me since last week, right? And it has. let me just read the question. I got this one on yeah. YouTube, I think, from my Money Mondays video yesterday. And the question says, or comment, digital currency means that the government will know all your business. Yes, paper currency is still private. If I pay, <laughs> if I pay my go-go dancer, I don't want anyone to know. So the, the question has to do with, um, with privacy concerns. A lot of people have the concern that if they use Jamdex, if they use digital currency, now the government has access to all your transactions and they know what you're doing with your money. And that's not the case with Jamdex. You know, once you register with your wallet provider, only your wallet provider has your information. So all of that, know your customer information, your customer due diligence, your name, your address, all of that sits and, 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 and is safe is, is held in safekeeping at your wallet provider. Now the Bank of Jamaica does not have that information and we won't know that information. So certainly your information is kept private. What comes back to, to the Bank of Jamaica is really just information on that digital currency and it's just transactional information for us to better understand the flow and circulation of money. And that's all we see on aggregate. All right. I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. This has been very enlightening in helping us to understand what Jamdex is and how it works. And once again, I encourage you all to watch the video from the beginning so that you can get the answers to your questions. Additional questions will be taken next week, Monday on Money Mondays JA. And we are expected to have a representative from NCB's link explaining how that works. And you would have heard Mario reference several times that certain things are up to the wallet provider, how they want to manage the transactions. And so we do have a lot of questions for Link and the other providers when they come on stream as well. Thank you for joining me, Mario. Thank you, Kalila. It's been a pleasure. All right, so to our viewers and listeners, let me know, take our poll question. You can go to the community tab of my YouTube channel, or you can, if you're using the YouTube on an app on your mobile device, the question will probably pop up somewhere on your stream. What is your biggest concern with Jamaica's digital currency, Jamdex? Answer that question in our poll. Up next is your market recap, and the analysts are standing by. Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap. It was a good week on Jamaica Stock Exchange, with the combined index gaining 11,400 points or nearly 3%. 
112 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the week ending Friday, March 11, 2022. 56 advanced, 53 declined, and 3 stayed the same. 181 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling nearly $2.2 billion. Wow! Fesco was the most traded stock, taking up 16% of market volume, with people buying and selling 29 million shares in the company. However, Fesco was also the second biggest loser last week. The stock was down 16% to open on Monday at $6.60. Tropical Battery traded the second highest volume. People bought and sold 16 million shares in the company. The stock price gained 7 cents to open the new week at $2.25. And QWI Investments rounded out the most traded, taking up nearly 9% of market volume, with nearly 16 million shares trading. The stock's price fell to open this week at 95 cents. Now let's see who had the biggest gains for the week. Cargo handlers jumped nearly 33% to close last week at $11.92. Following its stock split last Thursday, Massey Holdings ended the week up 31% to open this week at $128.20. And rounding out our biggest gains, Mayberry Investments is up 24% to open this week at $7.39. On the losing side now, KLE Group was this week's biggest loser, down nearly 18% to open the new week at $2.30. And Sterling Investments USD was down 13% to close last week at $0.02 cents US. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers. Welcome back. Time now for The Analysts. And thank you very much, Jamelia, for looking out. Jamelia says, Guruka, like the live video, man. Like it. Yes, give us those likes. I see over 200 people are joining us now, but not 200 likes on the video. So give us a like and let other people know. Let the algorithm know that this video is important, that this video should be viewed by many, 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 many people. So I'm glad that you all found that discussion informative. Like I said, we have, I guess, part two coming up uh, next week, Monday on Money Mondays JA, when we will be talking with the first digital wallet provider. Right now, though, we have the analysts on with us because we have some market developments that we need to talk about. And let's let's introduce our analyst panel. First up is equity trader at JMMB, Clive Charlton, business writer at the Jamaica Observer, David Rose, and financial coach, founder and CEO of Profit Jumpstarter, Keisha Bailey. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. All right. So... Let's talk about market developments today. So let me just give you today's trading summary uh, very quickly, since we did have two new listings this call, week. Up thirty-two <laughs> percent. Well, I'm still, you steal my thunder, uh, David. I was just about to say. Sorry. So all right. So we had a lot of trading today. Ninety-four stocks in total traded, and JFP was actually the volume leader. That's the company formerly known as Jamaica Fiberglass, 13 million units traded, followed by Wigton and then Lumber Depot. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Edufocal, and if you're wondering what their ticker is, and you're looking under E and you don't say Edufocal, it's actually LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, LEARN is the ticker symbol for Edufocal, and it ended the day's trading at $1.32. You will remember that the IPO price was $1, so it's up uh, 32% basically. And for JFP, let's see where they ended today. This is their second day in trading. They're listed on Monday, and JFP is now at $1.64. Recall that their IPO price was also $1. So both of them uh, would have been limited by the circuit breaker rule, right, David? Yes, Kalila, correct. The gains on those. So that's where we are with our two brand new listings. What else can you tell us about those, Mr. Rose? Well... <laughs> Today, you only saw 9,232 units being traded for any focal. And the reason why is nobody could sell it. Or in this case, the Mayberry clients didn't want to sell because all 100 units traded at 30, 40 per hour, and a couple more trades to 132, and that was it. Because for those who don't know, JMB was down today, and when any focal IPO, only JMB and Mayberry clients were able to actually purchase an IPO. Hence, when the JMB clients were there in the market, they couldn't sell basically, you know, earn a volume. So 
it really happened. And for JP, Hall said to dollar sixty four in the morning, sorry, dollar sixty, and trade them to high dollar sixty eight. So it's a good looking, a uh, good show for you know other investors, and you know even Weber's current price is actually below BM World's actual target price of dollar fifty two. So it's a good first uh, day for any folk and a good first day, two days for JFP because here's the funny thing about Kalila. I have never seen a junior market company in the volume lead up for on their first day. Just, You've I'm, never seen a what? I've never seen a junior market listing actually be the market the volume leader on its first but, day. Of right, listing. right. Think about that. It, and that was the that 60 million shares are up to the general public. About eight or third, 12 million shares traded, 10 million shares traded on the first day, and it was volume leader. Like, think about that. Winton trying to make a, take the volume leader spot every day, but JP came up first day and like that. Mm -hmm. Volume leader. Right. So between the two of them, a lot of people wanting to exit early and take their early gains. And then a lot of people who never got what they wanted or never applied in the first place trying to, to jump in as early profit as profit. possible. Yeah, I guess yeah. it's in, in, in college, it's that one, so. Right. Mm -hmm. And I do understand, like you mentioned, that uh, JMMB's money line was down today. There were a lot of complaints about that. And you know, some people who say, today of all days, <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to, to, to make that early flip. I don't know. I, don't, I know that's not your department, Clive, but by chance, do you have any update for us on that? It's up, it's up again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, yes, the system is now up and running. Um, it was one of those technical problems uh, the, unrelated to the, 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 the personnel, really. Uh, you know, these systems must be cooled, apparently. This uh, One of the servers, I'm not sure if it's domiciled here, uh, that heavy servers that stores all the information. Um, there were some difficulties, so they had to shut down the system and, you know, bring them back up uh, one by one. You know, there's a process when you're dealing with this thing. Um, but they were able to use other locations at the same time while bringing up the system slowly. And now everything is perfectly fine up and running. And tomorrow morning, you have full 100% access uh, to your uh, to the system. All right. Thank you very much for that update. And yes, I did use it this evening myself as well. And yeah, it, it's, it's working now, yes. thankfully. Um, all right. So, Clive, tell us about the early trading for these two stocks. What is the interest that you're seeing? And okay. I've, I've told you the numbers already. Right. You know, first and foremost, here's the thing. Um, while when JFP, Jamaica Fiberglass Product, uh, issued their prospectus, uh, quite a number of brokerage houses had poor analysis, had a negative recommendation on it. One said, don't buy, but they said that it would are as well for the portfolio. Um, what is interesting, I think many of them are looking at the previous, uh, just the last 2021, nine months results. Uh, the four years prior to that, five years prior to that, 2020 going back to 2019, 2016, it, it seemed to me that the analysts did not explore, the all the analysts, at least four uh, analysts, analysts I saw did not explore that sufficiently you see um interesting what i saw with, with jamaica fiberglass product the jfp is that the prior 2020 going back were fairly good as a matter of fact good years because you saw consistent growth in revenue and profit between 2016 to 2020 then 2021 nine months there's a precipitous fall in revenue now you must ask yourself what could have caused this why would the company grow for so many years and then suddenly fall off. The quality of the product that international franchise, franchisees, yes, are Jamaicans, but the international company that manages and owns these uh, companies would have allowed their franchisees to contract this company to make uh, products that is, you know, the interior, etc. The quality, the standard are there, is there, excellent. And I think there, I think analysts, many analysts overlooked the prior years, the effect of the pandemic, and the nature of this business also. As I indicated to some of our team members in our weekly discussions, that this company, the product line, the product base is not one that has a very short production process. For example, you're manufacturing sweets, biscuit, beer, where you can turn out individual discrete units. Uh, every perhaps the production uh, hour might run, pr production process might run for an hour, a day or a week, and you're rolling out 
volume consistently to generate revenue and put them on the shelves for them to generate revenue. No, the nature of this business is that you must first negotiate a contract. Um, your revenue stream might be might probably be fixed, more or less fixed, for at least a period of time, maybe six months to a year. And then in between that time, you have all this different cost structure to, to confront. For example, just since last year, they would have had uh, the increase in base interest policy rate, which means subsequent interest increase in interest rate and perhaps debt on other financial instruments. They would have had a rapid devaluation of the Jamaican dollar. Yes, subsequent to that, our dollar has revalued significantly. You see, so these are things that would impact a company like that. I can understand that 2020 in the heat heart of the pandemic, they still generated good revenue 2020 year end. 2021 now, the just the January to September was when they had a significant fall off. What? Why would that have happened? I believe that in 2020, contracts were withdrawn, contracts were renegotiated, and contracts were just not entered into. And that is why we saw a precipitous fall. And I think that's an easy read. So they stated in the prospectus that they would that they have a pipeline of projects valued in excess of $200 million for 2022. That is an indication that uh, the recovery process uh, in terms of COVID, post-COVID recovery, nationally, uh, and the national economy is happening. It means that people are now getting also used to the new way of doing things throughout COVID. So therefore, their contracts are now coming back onto stream. And it seemed to me that many analysts did not look at that. Also, in terms of portfolio management, separate and apart from just a contract. Um, if you look at it, the business line is uniquely different from many other companies, manufacturing slash processing companies that are listed on the JC. So it provides the perfect opportunity for a nice diversification of risk to your portfolio. So that's another reason to buy it. Granted, that might be long term, but it did provide opportunity. And there's a teeny weeny bit of, I mean, what, less than 100 million shares issued. That really is not a lot. So there would have been a shortage. But I think the market post listing saw the potential value. You know, we're yet to realize the value of those contracts. You know, I remember the cost structure is something that they'll deal with day to day when they have actually locked in, more or less locked in their revenue stream. But I think there's a lot of opportunity looking at the prospectus. Uh, the management seem to be a quite sensible, competent management team. I think there's opportunity for diversification outside of these type of retail food establishment. You know, the quality of their product, there's no question about it. So I think that there's good opportunity. And I think the market generally post listing realize is that this company perhaps has some good opportunity. Learning also provides some uh, opportunity for diversification of portfolio, even though the financials were, I think, a little bit less um, in terms of value than J. You're talking about Edifocal now? Edifocal, yes. But it provides also diversification. And I believe that the market is looking longer term. So they are willing to buy and hold especially institutional fund managers, high net worth in, you know, individuals, I think they're willing to buy and hold until some form of revenue can be generated. And the COVID kind of helped Edifocal also uh, in terms of their online provisions, you know, educational provisions. You know? And I assume that that line can grow further going into the future. And I think the market post-listing saw these opportunities and reacted accordingly. Oh, Clive, it sounds like you've been waiting for a while to say that. <laughs> to say, yeah, oh, let me tell you something. I especially, think I got, especially on JFP. I got a licking for it. Yeah. And I, I held my position that look here, there is look at the prospectus. There's potential in this company. And the market saw it. I mean, apart from the, 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 the supply, the lack of supply, really. Yes. But the market saw the volume that traded and the price still went up or held its high um, position. You know, that to me is an indication, granted it's still early times, you know, um, but at, that, at, at the average price that the market came in, I don't see speculators dumping soon unless they believe it may go up to $2 and they can dump and reap some benefit. You know, if it stays flat for, for too long, then persons who bought into it might begin to let off some, but that's a normal flow of the market and we expected that. But what I think was not expected was a significant 
demand that was created that came into the market for that security. I, to be honest with you, I didn't expect that level of demand either. But I thought that it had good potential and it's something that we should at least go into. Now, in terms of portfolio recommendation, when well, well, buy, let, me get, let me get Keisha in on that and we can yes. come back to you. Okay, we're yes. talking for uh, a minute to yes. Clive. And I'm doing <laughs> your, your yeah. perspective, but I'm very yeah. curious to hear what Very, very spirited. I feel the passion. Yeah, man. Yeah. Passion, Clive. I feel it. So I, I guess Yes, back in the trading room, we had some discussion around it then. But mm -hmm. I do echo some of your, your, your concerns or your thoughts around JFP mm -hmm. and Learn. They are two really good companies. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is, though, the IPOs were small. And so we mm -hmm. do expect Personal. now that we're having that FOMO kicking in. So it's going to drive the price higher, which is what we're seeing now. Persons are saying, yeah, I want to get in. I want to get in. I, made, I missed out. I missed out. They probably didn't get the full allotment. So they're going in. From a long-term perspective, yes, both companies do have favorable future projections. And yes, that will help you know, to push the stock price even higher. But the trading right now is, up, I think it's mainly formal based And mm -hmm. JMM's tech outage today serves to increase the formal even more. And oh, so yeah. there will be even more heightened activity tomorrow when persons freely can trade and get back in here. So yeah. I think cool. tomorrow is going to be another update. We may right. keep going limit up on the trades for both companies. And this week would be a big week for them. I wouldn't be surprised if they're double. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at another company that's been in the news lately, and that is Massey. So Massey did their stock split effective last week, Thursday, and the price came down from, I even remember how much, almost $2,000 to yes. I think a little bit less than 100 And let's see what impact that has had. So I know on the first day, the stock price was up and then on the second day which would have been monday it came right back down and today we're at let's see a hundred and thirty dollars and sixty cents i can share my screen so that you guys can see what that impact actually looks like on 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 paper or on a chart on a graph so you can see what that looks like just give me a sec and you're gonna see what it is all right here we go so massey started out at $2,463. The stock price came down a little bit and into the 1900 range. And then here is that split where you see that steep decline. That is when they did their stock split. So it came from uh, 1952 thereabouts. And I think my computer is moving a little bit slow and it went down to $122 on the first day of the split. And uh -huh. then we saw some gains to 128 on Friday. Then on Monday, it dropped to 104, and today it's at 103.60. So, David, uh, explain what's going on here. Uh, so, for one, you said 130.60 a while ago. So, I tried to correct that little interpolation a while ago due to that price difference. Uh, and it's, it's not surprising. So, for context, uh, Massey trades about the JSC and the TTSC, the Trinidad Tobago Stock Exchange. So, in Trinidad, this which occurred from Wednesday, the price adjustment, and in Jamaica, it occurred on the Thursday, because we have different symmetries between Jamaica and Trinidad. So, in our case, the extra shares were available for trading until yesterday. So, because of that, within the first uh, two days, with the price adjustment, it's about to go as high as 130 JMD, which should have been uh, 2,600 Jamaica dollars, which should have been above listed price. But because it's the shares now, it can actually still make a profit. Because when they, was, when they split, the split was like around 98, 99 dollars, Jamaica dollars, right? And uh, you can also know at 120 or 110, I can make profit. That's just the reality. In turn that it went, as, it went from uh, about 105 TT, so just 6 TT, 5 dollars TT. We just had seven dollars twenty-five TT, and it traded down to the six dollars ninety TT, which is about one hundred and forty-two dollars. So both markets saw you know that price rise as this occurred, and then as the shares came in on the Monday, it just came back down as prices of profit. And it's a surprise, like as our stock splits are. The thing is, if the masses of results are interested of hurt persons, it might just go back up even further. So, I think you're talking about they had a 20 to 1 stock, but they had 100 units, 
you don't have two dozen units, but at a lower price. Right. Uh, Clive, your take on Massey post split? Yes, um, yes. In, you know, we, we kind of saw it, how the market behaves. Now, $2,463, that's a new, new thing on our market, right? So, but what I found interesting when it was listed in January 26, uh, the equivalent TT, equivalent of $160, which is about 2463 Jamaican, was the number of orders that came in on the bid side. I was kind of surprised. Even though it's one, you say a five unit, one unit, 10 unit, 100 unit, but the number of orders, the number of orders that traded also was way in excess of what had traded for any other security. I'm not talking the volume, but the number of orders. To me, that indicated that individuals are interested in the security. The company is fundamentally solid, yes. Huh? Um, and if you look at the regional diversification, I'm not sure if you can see my thing here. Can you see um, uh, the PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Right. Now, Look at the, 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 just compare to so many Jamaican business. We have conglomerates in Jamaica, but look at this integrated retail, gas products, motor and machine, financial services. This is the revenue generating business lines. These are the revenue generating territories. Uh, you can see how diversified or spread out it is. Um, you know, this kind of mitigates some risk, but not much because Trinidad, Eastern Barbados makes up the bulk and Guyana, right? But um, look at the the, 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 the global impact, you see, and the countries that it has business operations in, 15 countries, uh, over 60 companies. So I think it provides a brand new opportunity for the Jamaican marketplace. Now, in terms of the split, there's a, I think it has more, the split, what it does is drive liquidity. You know, you, you multiply the number of shares and then you adjust the price. So we don't want to use the word decline in price or reduction in price. It's an adjustment downward to the price because the total value of the company remains the same. One stock value $2,463 divided by 20, you get what? 20 stock value, whatever they, they divide 2,463 by 20, right? So the total value of the company remains the same. But, um, the stock split now, when it was adjusted, we expected there has been a new pattern of behavior post stock split over the last four years, and certain conditions caused that, right? I think people are more, more, more players are in the marketplace, more people are thinking to drive them wealth by buying stocks, more people are thinking long term, as well as there's more liquidity in the market space, right? So there's more money to run down securities. So people have been running up stocks, driving stock prices up post stock split rather than pull back on the prices. That has happened with, with Massey. Here's a, the big play now with cross-listed securities. We now have two market. One security, Massey, listed in two different market. One security, like GMB, NCB, Grace Kennedy, listed in two markets. Same thing with Guardian Holding. One security listed in two markets. So you find out now that the two markets now can move security between each other based on how the surprises and what they saw now when the price ran up to about 123, close about 122 something on the first day of the, the, the stock split, and then traded up as high as $128 something. What the Trinis saw was an opportunity again to send shares here and offload it. My assumption is that the average, I would assume that the Trinis, their average cost is lower because from the stock was announced. When the company announced that they were going to cross list last year, May, the stock was trading at the TT equivalent of about 66 TT dollars. By the time it was listed in Jamaica in January, it was trading at the TT dollar equivalent of about 100, 105, 99, 106 TT dollars. So my assumption is if they were buying from then, their average cost would have been lower. So they can afford to, sell, to send the shares to Jamaica and sell, you know, at whatever price it is trading here, even pull the price down and still be ahead. So that, I think, has contributed to the price, a slight pullback in the price. Uh, shares moving cross-border, you know, buying in Trinidad and selling Jamaica, where there's a lot of liquidity and a fair demand for it. Mm, okay. Thanks for that explanation, Clive. Now, another company that has announced a stock split, and this is in the United States, Keisha, is Amazon. They've announced yeah. a stock split coming up in June, as well as a share buyback. Yeah. So we've been going over what stock splits are for the past few weeks. Explain what the share buyback portion of it represents. Yeah. Okay, so the share buyback for Amazon is the, the big part of it, because that means the company will be buying back shares from investors. They're cre creating demand for their stock. So 
Amazon management, senior management team with the CEO will now start buying back shares. So your shares that are there, they're going to be creating demand, putting up orders to buy. You can then sell into that demand if you want to. But what that's going to do is drive the price higher because the company is creating demand. It's a way for the company to reward shareholders. There are two ways generally. One, dividends. Two, share buyback as well. And it's also a very positive sign about the future prospects of the company because if management is able to pay back shareholders, buy back shares, then obviously then fundamentally and financially, things are very strong for the company if they can find cash available to give back to their shareholders. So that's going to be nice trading in Amazon later this year. We're gonna Was it $10 start. billion dollars worth of shares they said they would buy back? Yes. I'm trying to remember the number. 10 yeah. billion, yeah. yeah. And when, when a company does a share buyback, do they typically do so above the current market price? No, they're going to do it at market. But because they're creating demand, the price will move up because they're just going to keep buying and buying and buying. And how the, the trading would work is that you put your orders in until they've reached that quota, they will over time keep buying. So the price will move incrementally higher. Because so did they say if they would be doing the share buyback before or after the split? It would be after. After the split. All right. doing, so yeah, after so. June. And then in July, we have... Um, Google, Google Alphabet, 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 well. Alphabet. Yeah. Alphabet is the correct name. Yeah, what's interesting is the 20 to 1 ratio because Massey did the same split as well, right? So that seems to be a nice secret number there. And if we, if we take number, what right? happened, if we take what happened with Massey, look then, Amazon, Google, bigger companies, look at the price movement in Massey. You can get some inference on what the price movement will be for Amazon and Google later this year. And finally, Keisha, I want to touch briefly on what's going on in the United States as well with the Federal yeah. Reserve. They are expected to increase interest rates. And, yeah. you know, we still have all this uncertainty over the Ukraine crisis. So is, is that what is driving this speculation that interest rates in the U.S. are going up again? And what impact will that likely have? Right. OK, so last year, U.S. Federal Reserve announced they would look to start increasing interest rates post the pandemic because we've been moving out of it the war between russia and um, ukraine definitely put another um a different spin on things but still what it does is that the federal reserve will slow down the pace of hiking they're still going ahead and today um fed chairman jerome powell announced yes we're going to be doing a 0.25 percent rate increase a 25 basis point rate increase tomorrow Meaning then the benchmark rate, the Fed rate in the U.S. will go from 0.25% to 0.5%. That means credit cards higher, mortgage higher, any form of floating rate, um, rate loan, their rates will go higher as well. That's what we'll see on the consumer side. On the investor side, sectors that benefit from higher interest rates now are going to get that bump up in price. But still, war is in the mix. Until there's a resolution, we really can't breathe a sigh of relief to say, yes, you know, the market is going to pick up. It's been very volatile, very painful for my own little portfolio, very painful to see the red, but <laughs> we know tough times don't last forever. It will pick up again eventually. But the Fed rate hike does still, they're still on course, they're still going ahead. I expect that we're going to have additional rate hikes later this year. And we may see some 50 basis points rate hikes coming into the mix as well. But the Fed is going ahead, war or no war. They've just slowed down the pace to accommodate all of this uncertainty happening now. Hold strong, hold firm when you see the red line. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I add a, the uh, uh, <laughs> Yes, yes, David. Yeah. So one thing to point out is that today started to release the inflation numbers and point what inflation of February 2021 February 2022 was 10.7%. In January, it was 9.7%. So, you know, we're going to feel some potential more increased rate hikes come when the BOJ's Monetary Policy Committee meets. So, that's something to consider. And the thing is, the Federal Reserve is making this official decision tomorrow. So, we don't say that a basis rate hike, BOJ is going to be like, that's it, that's it, plus inflation. And that's one thing to also consider. The thing is, here in Jamaica, first, we're capital holdings actually announced you know, its own share buyback as well. 
where they're going to buy back up to 10% of their issued share capital uh, from shareholders. And for those what other examples of the market of share buybacks, they have Kickstarter Properties Limited, they have Epic Care Property Fund Value Fund, and you also have CNWJ Community Credit Union Deferred Shares. So for those who how share market works, is that the company goes, by the an open market, and cancels them. What this is does is that for one, decrease the number of shares in circulation. So for JMB, they're staking the such a special company, it went from 22.5% to 23.22% over the last two years, but the JMB spent a night more to buy more shares. That's how share benefits you as a shareholder in essence. And the thing is, it's more tax effective because when it's a dividend, it's taxed at a rate of 15%, basically, when the share buyback, but it is taxed in that respect. And the thing is, it creates liquidity of the shares in the market. So I hope can get some context as well as what's going on in the market here in Jamaica. Thank you, uh, David. Thanks as well, Clive. Thanks, Keisha, for joining us this evening. We always appreciate your analysis. <laughs> You're yeah, welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. All right. All right. Take care. Thank All you. All right. We'll be right back. Be good. And to the analysts was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers. Hey, money makers! You're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit KalilaReynolds.com/store to order your T-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. Thanks for thanks for sticking with us, viewers. And let me just take a few of your final comments. I see strong links. There's a whole lot of speculating going on, so things are all over the place. Risk averse investors perhaps should wait until the dust settles down. Uh, good advice if you're risk averse, you're not too much on the risk. Yeah, <laughs> wait and see is always a safe approach. Uh, Strong Link also said, Oh, what's going on with my computer? All right, Lushand says, Holding and buying. If I'm down 20%, I will buy back that 20%. Donna says, very informative. I'm glad you found it very informative, Donna. We are here to serve. So remember to subscribe to the newsletter at kalilarunnels.com slash newsletter. If you're new to all of this and you have no idea what we're talking about, what you want to know, so maybe you joined us for the Jamdex conversation and then stuck around for the analysts and realize, wait, there are opportunities here that I should know about then you should take my Investing for Beginners Masterclass at kalilareynolds.com slash masterclass. I also want to say a very special thank you to my hardworking production team who gets it done every week so that we can be here with you on Tuesday. And I'm encouraging you as well to tune in. Well, last night on Money Mondays JA, I gave an overview of what is Jamdex. So you can watch that video tonight here on this program. You can go back to the beginning if you joined us late and understand a bit more. We got an opportunity to ask a question or ask our questions to a representative from the Bank of Jamaica, Mario. His last name eludes me at this point, but he's one of the technical personnel at the BOJ. And he gave us a lot of answers to our questions about Jamdex. And then next week, Monday, we are going to be talking to a digital wallet provider that is from NCB Link, explaining how it works and what the subtle differences are between electronic money versus Jamdex. What are the offerings that they are making? How this whole thing works and what difference it is likely to have. So make sure you tune in for all of that. And of course, I'm Khalida Reynolds. And what? Let's get this money. This money. <laughs> <laughs>